This is Paul Ekberg from the Division of Infectious Diseases at Stanford University. This video is intended to be part two in the discussion of antibiotics that target nucleic acids, sometimes loosely referred to as DNA synthesis inhibitors or DNA damagers. The fluoroquinolones were discussed in part one, while other classes that target nucleic acids will be discussed here in part two, including the rifamycins, the folate synthesis inhibitors, and the nitroimidazoles. Learning objectives include describe the differences in mechanism of action between the lipiromycins and the rifamycins, state the sole clinical indication for fidaxomycin, list the main adverse effects associated with the rifamycins, describe how trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole are synergistic in combination, and describe the unique mechanism of action of metronidazole and how it limits its spectrum of activity in clinical use. As mentioned, the fluoroquinolones were discussed in part one of antibiotics that target nucleic acids. In this part two video, we will focus on the RNA polymerase inhibitors, the folate synthesis inhibitors, and the DNA damagers, all highlighted in yellow in the upper right corner. First, we will cover the RNA polymerase inhibitors, consisting of two main classes of antibiotics, the lipiromycins and the rifamycins. The figure on the left depicts the site of action of these two classes. At a very basic level, the lipiromycins in the top part of the figure block transcription by binding to RNA polymerase and DNA prior to formation of the open DNA complex. However, specific details of this mechanism remain unknown. Recall that transcription is the first step of gene expression where DNA is copied into messenger RNA. In contrast, the rifamycins block a later stage of transcription by binding to the beta subunit of RNA polymerase. The inhibition of transcription by either class is bactericidal in nature. The lipier mycins are new kids on the block. As you can see in the blue box, there is only one representative member of this class available in the US called fidaxomycin, which was FDA approved in 2011. The structure shows similarity with the macrolide class of antibiotics, but fidaxomycin is bactericidal rather than bacteriostatic and has a very narrow spectrum of activity, namely Clostridium difficile. Therefore, its only indication is the treatment of Clostridium difficile associated disease. Its poor activity versus other anaerobes prevents a wider destructive effect on the intestinal microbiota. Not a lot is known about resistance development in vivo, in part because of its novelty and relatively rare use. Fidaxomycin is very well tolerated, which might be related to the fact that this agent is not systemically absorbed to any extent. That is, drug concentrations remain secluded to the intestinal tract lumen after oral administration. This property is similar to that of oral vancomycin, which you heard about in the cell wall inhibitors video. Rifamycins are potent RNA polymerase inhibitors that have a broad spectrum of activity as shown here in the first bullet. However, it's important to note that this class of agents is primarily used in the treatment of mycobacterial disease, namely tuberculosis, and therefore these agents will be covered in more detail in mycobacterial and tuberculosis videos. One exception is the newest rifamycin called rifaximin, which is similar in some ways to fidaxomycin discussed on the prior slide, in that this agent is not systemically absorbed from the intestines and achieves high intraluminal concentrations. It is used primarily as a second line agent for gastroenteritis, especially traveler's diarrhea. Adverse effects include orange discoloration of the urine, sweat, or tears. You can see this in the lower right hand picture. Thrombocytopenia, which is decreased platelets. Hepatic effects, such as non-obstructive cholestasis with an increased level of bilirubin in the blood, and rarely drug-induced hepatitis, and renal dysfunction, which is rare. Finally, this class of agents can induce the metabolism of other drugs metabolized by the cytochrome P450 system, leading to important drug-drug interactions in decreasing the serum levels of other drugs to potentially non-therapeutic levels. We will now shift gears to the folic acid synthesis inhibitors, which constitute two antibiotic classes that inhibit folate synthesis at different points along the folic acid synthesis pathway, as shown here in the figure. 
The first is the sulfonamide class, and the second is the benzyl pyrimidine class. Their enzymatic targets are highlighted by the red symbols in the figure, namely dihydroteroate synthetase and dihydrofolate reductase, respectively. Focusing on the sulfonamides first in the blue box, note that the dihydroteroate synthetase target is unique to bacterial cells. Most bacteria can't take up exogenous folate from the environment, and they must synthesize it from paraaminobenzoic acid, or PABA, also seen in the figure above. The sulfonamides are structural analogs of PABA, and they compete with PABA and bind to and inhibit dihydroteroate synthetase. This blocks folic acid production, which is essential for purine and DNA synthesis. The benzyl pyrimidines in the lower right-hand corner are structurally similar to dihydrofolate acid. These compounds bind to and inhibit dihydrofolate reductase, which is not unique to microorganisms. However, the drugs in this class are much less potent versus the human form of this enzyme than the bacterial forms. Note that trimethoprim is antibacterial and is almost always administered in combination with sulfamethoxazole as a fixed combination called TMP-SMX, as you can see here in the yellow circle. This is trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. In contrast, pyrimethamine, another benzyl pyrimidine, is antiparasitic and will be discussed in a separate video on protozoal infections. Although resistance mechanisms won't be described in any detail here, you can surmise how bacteria might develop resistance to these agents. Sulfonamide resistance might result from overproduction of PABA or via dihydroteroate synthetase mutations, which would have low affinity for sulfonamides. Similarly, trimethoprim resistance might result from overproduction of dihydrofolate reductase or via dihydrofolate reductase mutations with low affinity for trimethoprim. As mentioned, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole is a synergistic combination of two folate synthesis inhibitors. On this slide, I will briefly mention the spectrum of activity and the common clinical uses of this combination. With regard to clinical uses, this drug used to be one of the mainstays of therapy for urinary tract infection and still is in areas with low prevalence of gram-negative rod resistance. However, its widespread use has been impacted by a dramatic rise in resistance over recent years, especially among E. coli isolates. You might recognize that this scenario is very similar to that described for fluoroquinolone use in this infection, as reviewed in the quinolones video. Trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole is also used in a few uncommon infectious diseases, such as Whipple's disease, shigellosis, and infections caused by Stenotrophomonas multifilia, which is a bacterium that causes nosocomial pneumonia and other nosocomial infections. I encourage you to read about these uncommon infections on your own. Trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole is associated with a few key adverse effects. Hypersensitivity is the most common. The accompanying picture demonstrates a very severe rash called erythema multiforme, also called Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which is associated with sulfonamide use. Hypersensitivity can also be manifested by nonspecific rashes, hepatitis, nephritis, or even drug fever. Gastrointestinal effects are common, including nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea as you've heard me say a number of times with numerous antibiotic classes. Precipitation in the urine can lead to crystalluria and associated abnormalities detected on urinalysis. However, this does not commonly alter renal function itself. Hematological abnormalities can affect any blood cell line, whether low white cells, low red blood cells, or low platelets. And finally, this drug is contraindicated in pregnancy as drug-related hyperbilirubinemia, or elevated bilirubin levels in the blood in the pregnant mother, can lead to accumulation of bilirubin in the basal ganglia or other deep gray matter of the brain in the growing infant, called kernicterus, which is neurotoxic and has the potential to lead to severe brain damage in the child. Finally, we will briefly discuss the nitroimidazole class, of which there is one available member in the United States called metronidazole. Similar to trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, 
This agent has both protozoal and bacterial activity that we will focus here on its antibacterial activity, which is restricted to the anaerobic bacteria. This unique spectrum of activity can be explained by its mechanism of action. Metronidazole is selectively absorbed by anaerobes and partially reduced inside the anaerobic bacterial cell to toxic metabolites, depicted in the accompanying figure. These metabolites directly damage DNA, leading to cell death. Regarding clinical uses, metronidazole is most commonly used in combination with other agents for mixed aerobic anaerobic infections, such as intra-abdominal infections or polymicrobial brain abscesses. Metronidazole is also used as monotherapy for certain types of vaginitis, trichomoniasis and bacterial vaginosis, and also for C. difficile associated disease. Note that metronidazole remains as one of the frontline therapies for this particular infection. Finally, key adverse effects are listed in the last bullet, including GI intolerance, such as nausea and vomiting. Some patients might experience a metallic taste. Others may experience a disulfiram-like reaction. Therefore, concomitant alcohol use should be prohibited. And finally, among patients who might receive very high doses or very long durations of this drug might experience a very rare peripheral neuropathy.